So thank you so much uh, for joining me for another episode of uh, the African Father in America podcast. My name is Simon Javan Okelo. I am in Seattle, Washington. I am in Seattle, Washington, and I love uh, coming here on the show every Monday to Friday uh, at 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time in order to share with you a new African proverb and also in order to share with you three nuggets, three things that you can learn from this amazing African proverb that we are discussing today. I might have a guest later on, uh, you know, for the show, and uh, I will let you know once that's confirmed. But for now, uh, we I want to let you know that we are live streaming on YouTube. For everyone who is joining us on YouTube, thank you so much uh, for the support. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, this is a good time for you to do that. Also, everyone joining us on Clubhouse, where we are also live streaming this conversation. Thank you so much. I deeply, deeply appreciate the support. And, uh, you know, uh, I want to share the proverb that we are discussing here today. Uh, and uh, I'll, in a moment, I'll be sharing some of the nuggets that you can gain from this proverb so uh, just give me one moment i want to just make sure that my uh my guest is doing okay um uh so just give me one moment as i figure out how to uh get my guest into the room uh but I want to also appreciate MK. I see that you're there joining me. I have a guest that is joining us for today's show, uh, really from here in the Pacific Northwest. And, uh, you know, I just can't wait to hear from her. Uh, and I also can't wait to hear from you all who are joining us here. So just give me a moment as I help her figure out some of this uh, technical glitches that we are going through i hope you all had a nice weekend uh i had a I had a nice weekend it went really fast um but you know uh i'll i'll make some portions of today feel like they are also the weekend um you know the proverb that we're discussing today a really amazing one uh it says well the topic itself is why unwillingness to improve leads to excuses not solutions you know why unwillingness to improve leads to laziness and not <laughs> and not solutions you know i just took it even further so um you know the structure of our show today uh, once our guest is confirmed um actually I have to find out what's going on for her here. She's having a hard time connecting. Good morning, Simon. Hi, how are you doing? And Steven. I'm so glad, but um, I'm at work. I am not able to talk, but um, I'll listen or maybe just take myself down. Yeah, you can just listen. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Good of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice to hear your voice. Rushi, how are you doing? Good morning, Simon. I am doing well, brother. I am doing well. No complaint. Well, you know, no complaints for me, man. None at all. Just happy to, just happy to be in this space. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for your support with Madaraka Festival. Uh, it was, you know, incredible to see you there and also just uh incredible to have your support uh that made it possible yeah. you know man it was it was incredible to be there you know you know modern rocket you know the crazy thing about modern rocket is being being able to uh be able being able to be around you being able to be around you for the last year or so and modern rocket is like the thing that the festival that you know we, we talk about all the time all this planning and to actually, when the day came and it was here, it was, you know, it reminded me of being a kid and it's, and it's Christmas time again. You know, it's like, it's like December 24th and 25th, like all year you, you wait, you wait for those presents, those gifts, and then it's finally here. And you're like, wow, you work, you work, you work so hard 
for two days, you know? So it was, it was such a, uh, to, be, to be honest with you, it was very inspiring to see you and the whole team together working on that. That was very, very inspiring. I appreciate the opportunity to just be able to witness witness the festival. So I thank you. I thank you so much for that. Er, 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 come on. Er, come on. <laughs> Karibu, karibu, karibu. You're welcome. Yeah, it was definitely incredible. Uh, I want to hear from Steve briefly as I continue helping our guests uh, join the show. How are you doing, Steve? Steve must be far from his microphone. So I will just begin the show here uh, by sharing the proverb uh, that we're discussing, which says that he who is unable to dance blames it on the stony yard. He who uh, is unable to dance blames it on the stony yard. You know, uh, this is going to be a very interesting conversation. I want you to think about what this proverb means for you. And I also want you to take a moment and ping in, you know, three to five people to join us for today's conversation. Um, I just appreciate you all for the support. Uh, so I want to, you know, just create space here. I want to welcome Brother Earth to the Daily African Proverbs. Uh, I, these are the three nuggets that I want you to note somewhere uh, while I try to figure out how to bring our guest onto the show. Um, so the first one here is uh, the unwillingness to improve can lead to excuses instead of solutions. You know, uh, this is, it's almost, this proverb is almost, um, it dire it's like a warning, you know, because it's very direct, you know. So, the first nugget is that it's true that the unwillingness to improve can lead to excuses instead of uh, solutions you know when you're afraid uh, to uh, to take a leap you know when you're as afraid to ask for help you know you are not willing to improve you know you are not willing to transform yourself you know and so you you find many excuses why you can't do something differently you know, in order for you to uh, experience something new, you know, whether it's with your business, whether it's with your relationships, whether it's at work, you know, you have to, you have to be willing, you know, you have to be willing. Um, number two, you may avoid seeking help because you are afraid to confront your shortcomings, you know. This has a lot to do with Madaraka Festival, you know. Um, many people, Many, many of us are always proud that you can't ask somebody for help. You can't ask someone that, hey, uh, even review this document for me. Uh, or I want you to contribute to this effort that we are making. Uh, these are the ways that you can be a part of it. So, um, you know, similar to how Brother Rushi and I were talking, I feel like that our relationship has deepened over the, the last two years, you know. Um, you know, we were able to do things together through Clubhouse here virtually. We didn't really know each other. Then we realized we were all living in Seattle. We met each other and uh, we connected. And then we traveled to Kenya together. We got back. We, we connected for months here on the show. And then eventually... You became one of the people that actually contributed to make Madaraka Festival happen, and then you are there physically. I think, I think that's that's really, really something. Uh, something that this second point speaks to. You know, you may avoid seeking help because you are afraid, afraid to confront your shortcomings. For me, my shortcomings was I could not do it alone. I could not do it alone financially. I could not do it alone even physically. Uh, I could not pull off Madaraka alone, even though I am the visionary behind it. And I was there from the very first moment that the idea of Madaraka Festival was being discussed to this moment. And so there are many people uh, who have always supported and, um, you know, and there are new people who are coming on to support. 
And uh, I want to go to the third point here that says that when you admit that there is room for growth and working to improve a to improve upon these areas you can set yourself up for success you know these are very very connected you know uh, at the time when we were beginning to do Madaraka festival even before Madaraka festival I was organizing events and uh, you know using the proceeds from these events not all the proceeds from the events but some to help uh, bring change in our community you know we were uh, helping provide food to kids at an orphanage home that my mom had uh, started in this in the slum and uh, you know we were also buying our own dj equipment and uh, becoming more stable and uh, well known as djs and then i moved to seattle where i had to rethink about how i wanted to approach uh, you know the work i was doing in the community as well as uh, my own uh, endeavors as an entrepreneur and also as a creative uh, and so that's why Madaraka festival was on CNN this past weekend and uh, it was just incredible to see that the work we've been doing from the slums of Manyata to this moment in Seattle Washington is now being recognized uh, uh, internationally so you know I feel that it's also because of the willingness to you know to be vulnerable to ask for help to work hard to try things that we've never tried before uh is really why we are we are on this track that we are we are on uh i want to just take a little breather here and invite some voices i see of course we have laron has just joined us uh and uh you know we, we have brother brother i would love to hear your voice you and laron if uh that's possible and uh, I want to see if I can continue helping this guest to join us. But uh, Rushi, when you hear this proverb, when you hear these three nuggets I was sharing, what is it that comes to your mind? Feel free uh, to engage. Okay, I see that Rushi is not in a position to engage at the moment. Uh, if you're just yeah, joining us. My, my phone. My, uh, you're my muted. Actually, <laughs> no, my club. No, what happened was my club I was at froze and it wouldn't let me. Uh, it just froze. Um, but yeah, the, I like this. Uh, the proverb, I definitely feel uh, I agree with what you were saying. I think uh, I know for myself sometimes uh <clears throat> you you want to sometimes you want to improve i want to improve but then you know you feel like the obstacle is too big or you don't know how to progress i know just for example i know with modern rock festival modern rock festival uh i gotta I have to commend you because it's, it's such a big it's such a big task you know you think about you think about what you think about what you're putting out what you're putting out to the world to see and I think I know for me, uh, when I got there, I was like, "Wow, this is, this isn't, this is a very big, big deal. It's a, this is a big festival. You know, you think about, I think about all the festivals I've been to, but I, you never think about all the work it takes to actually bring that to fruition and actually make that operate smoothly. And I think your team does, your, your team does such a good job. And I think for me, when I when I look at that, it's very it's very, it's very daunting. I'm thinking like, wow, how can I actually contribute to something that's so big? But when you think about it, it always takes so many people to make something, to make the engine go. All the parts have to be working. You know, the carburetor has to work, the, the, the fuel lines, everything has to work for the engine to go. So uh, I'm looking forward to being a bigger contributor next year for Modern Rock. And now that I now that I've seen what it looks like and I see the energy it has, sometimes from for myself and then maybe it's true for other people, sometimes you have to actually be inside of the storm to, to know how to weather that, you know? So um, yeah, I think I think that's what the proverb does speak. The proverb really does remind me of, you know, modern rocket and what it takes to be successful and actually keep, you have to keep going. Cause I think about where you, where you started with the festival and where it is now. And I think that's, 
that's it's big and, and it's it's, uh, it's getting bigger every year, you know. So uh, yes, <clears throat> this proverb really speaks to Madarak and it speaks to a lot of the values I have also. I agree, bro. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Uh, it, it, Madaraka has grown, uh, and you can trace it. You can trace it to the slums, uh, to the ghetto where I grew up, and um, you can also trace it through the artists, through the, as you're saying, the team. Uh, that includes the production team, you know, the stage managers, uh, the volunteers, the tech the tech people you know the people are doing the audio you know making sure the sound is right you know then the musicians you know the the bands you know we we started madaraka just with djs then we moved to live music festival uh, of course with the official dj of the festival and now we have like five to seven bands you know backing three artists each you know that's we had over uh, you know, artists from over 17 different countries on that stage, you know, so it was yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah, I know that was crazy. Yeah. I, I would love to ask you. I would love to ask you a couple of questions about about modern rock and to be honest with you. Yeah, ask because we were supposed to have a guest here and okay. uh, she's she is um, uh, running late, having some technical issues. OK. Uh, yeah, so we can have a conversation and then we can hear from Brother Ad. Okay, I, I wanted I wanted to ask you now that you've you've done this festival a couple of years here in Seattle, I believe. What what do you now that just just going through that festival this this period? What do you? What's one thing that you think that you would love to see happen next year? That if you could, what what's the what's the one thing that you want to improve with Modern Rock Festival? Now that you've been doing it for a while. Yeah, that's a really good question. I'll answer it in a moment. Uh, I, I was able to bring our guest in. Um, Angela, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Simon? I'm good. You look fantastic. Thank you for waking up so early. <laughs> it means a lot. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I had to start the show, uh, but the timing is just perfect. Uh, I was being asked a question. I'll, I'll make sure I answer that question to those who are uh, watching on YouTube and also to those who are listening in on Clubhouse. Uh, I have a really, really special guest today. So I want to introduce her before I come back and answer the question that uh, uh, my brother Rushi is asking. Um, First, Angela is an incredible leader, an incredible human being, and uh, you know I've seen her work here in Seattle in the community. Uh, you know, just touch many lives, especially during the pandemic. But I also saw her as a student at the University of Washington, so I've seen her evolution. And uh, today she's our special guest. But this Saturday we were together in SeaTac. You know, we are. Uh, she's involved uh, with a partnership with the Port of Seattle, and I'm also involved with uh, the Port of Seattle in the same program. So we interacted uh, in the community, and I just feel that we are going to be doing so much together uh, in the near future. But uh, first, the way the show runs, Angela, is that we bring an African proverb, and the guest shares what this proverb means to them, you know. So today's proverb, I want to share it with you so that you think about it. Uh, and then I'll just share a bit about what the program is going to look like. And then I'll answer Rushi's question. And hopefully by that time, you'll be ready to share with us what this proverb means to you. The proverb says, he who is unable to uh, dance blames it on the stony yard. He who is unable to dance blames it on the stony yard and this proverb really inspires today's topic which says that why unwillingness to improve leads to excuses and not solutions so think about that but uh, for those who are just joining us the structure of the daily african proverbs whenever we have a guest is that after we hear the interpretation of the proverb from the guest we go to a story from their childhood that inspires them today as a leader and then we go to, you know, uh, the guest's biggest accomplishment with what they're currently doing. Uh, for example, today we will learn 
a lot about what Angela is doing at uh, the Congolese Integration Network. She is the assistant program manager there and also the fund developer. And finally, you will learn how you can stay connected with Angela, how you can contribute to the work she's doing here in Seattle and, you know, and worldwide. So, Angela, do you want to say hello to everyone before I go back to answering this question? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Simon as well said, my name is Angela Yangi. And um, I was the assistant manager. I just haven't changed that on my LinkedIn, which was not too long ago. So uh, when I graduated in June, I was offered a position to be the fund developer and data manager of the Congolese Integration Network. That's beautiful. I want to talk more about that. Uh, so thank you for correcting that. Uh, now, let me answer this question uh, that Rushi asked earlier. Uh, Rushi, you asked what I have learned uh, after organizing Madaraka Festival uh, for the last eight years. I think An Angela probably wants to know the answer to this too. <laughs> Is that correct? Yeah, I, I want. I, I really want to know what you've learned, but also I want to know uh, as far as the vision you have for Madaraka. It's pretty sad, but what, what's that? When, what's the thing that you said? I want this to be. I want this to happen next year because. You know, like the proverb says, it's about improving. So, like, what what is that? What what have you learned? What's that vision? What have you learned? And what's that thing you want to make happen or make it make it better or make it improve? That's why I really that's why I'm really curious about. Yeah, you that's know? a, a very every, good question. Every year yeah. we always strive to be the better. So I want to know what that what that what does that look like for you? Yeah, as as the as a you know as the uh, person who. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, what that looks to me, number one, is that uh, by the end of the event, by the end of like the, the day after Madaraka Festival, uh, everybody is, is paid, you know, and uh, I am also one of those people who are paid for producing Madaraka Festival, you know, uh, and then I also want to have the budget for the next Madaraka in the bank by the end of the next, this coming Madaraka. I want to be like two years ahead in terms of planning uh, because that will put us in a very, very good position, you know. <laughs> so yeah. uh, we are talking to a fund developer, you know, someone who can actually help actualize these kinds of dreams. <laughs> but that's my ultimate goal, uh, really the last eight years has been uh, building Madaraka Festival as a brand and as a respected brand globally, not just uh, in Seattle. And we were able to achieve that. You know, we were on CNN for over, you know, 30 minutes for this past weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and, and that's huge. But that's outside of other media partnerships that we had uh this year with kexp being our our title sponsor you know uh and then we've always worked to build strong corporate partnerships for madaraka festival and uh you know amazon was one of our sponsors and microsoft alaska airlines uh you know uh, F fred hatch uh, research institute is also in a good place to partner with us keza uh, permanente so now it's on us to go back to these people with all this great content and also evidence of the data that we've, this is what we've accomplished. You know, there were over 7,000 people at Madaraka, you know, 3,800 on Saturday, 3,200 on Sunday, outside of the online audience, you know, uh, outside of the VIP experience at the W Hotel and the after party at Roomba Notes. Um, the, we, we just galvanized the community in a massive way. Our partnership with Converge Media, you know, has, has been great, uh, has really connected us with the African-American community. So, you know, we, we, we've built the foundation, you know, partnering with a venue like, uh, you know, what, Pier 62. You know, if you look at African events globally, very few are, are held at prestigious venues like that. And we've been consistent with that since 2014, you know. We look for partnerships that 
allow us to break barriers and bring our community to places that our communities are not always given access you know so the vision is to keep this foundation but to make sure people are getting paid uh and also to make sure we are doing this without too much stress you know right now uh because i'm from the ghetto i'm from a very uh humble background and it's taking it's still taking a lot of work for me look it's 6 a.m in the morning and i'm producing the daily african proverbs and uh uh you know if uh if i had a lot of ego i would not be here right now i was just on cnn you know i would be sleeping exactly. you know <laughs> but i know what i'm going for you know <laughs> right and i know i know the value of consistency and also i know the value of building real relationships you know uh and that's why i want to connect with people like you you know people like angela people like brother people that you know have similar desires you know uh to see something different especially for africa i was with angela recently and she asked me what's your ultimate goal like like well you you and angela ask me difficult questions Uh, soon I need to ask you difficult questions Angela um but really Rushi I want to jump into the actual interview uh and to actually listen to our 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 guest if you're just joining us on Clubhouse please uh join us on YouTube as well where we are having a beautiful conversation with Angela Angela Nyangi who is um you know an incredible leader here in Seattle Washington and uh, originally from Congo Uh Angela share with us your thoughts on the proverb and also share any part of you know your introduction that I didn't do properly you know what is it about you that uh, you want us to know about in this moment Um I think you just mentioned it um I'm a proud Congolese and so everywhere I go I'm like I'm Congolese yo um Yeah the that, other day that tells yeah The other day I shared uh, the the few uh, Congolese words I know bowling on ngai Bolingo uh, nangai na motema. Can you teach us a new Congolese word just uh, uh, for this moment? I'll teach you a good one. <laughs> Mbote, which means hello or bonjour. And then how do you reply? Uh you just say mbote back. So that's just, you know, ah. that's bonjour, bonjour back. Yeah. Ah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Excellent. So, uh Angela you know um i shared with you this proverb from kenya he who is unable to um he who is unable to dance blames it on the stony yard uh sp- speak to this a little bit what does it mean to you um it means a lot and that's one of the things i love about african proverbs is that you can see them in so many different culture and it makes sense you know we live in an environment especially in a country where there's so much opportunities but you will still see people blaming the system i'm not saying the system is perfect but even with the system as bad as it could be now people still excel and do best for themselves but how come we still have this category of people who still feel like because the system is bad they cannot do good for themselves Um that this is one of the things I experienced the most when I was a case manager when I was working as a mentor for youth you know when I came here I was 16 all I wanted was to speak English and get out of my high school and go to college but then seeing how other kids would come here younger than I was and speak English faster than I could but they were still you know uh, finding reasons to explain why they couldn't graduate and go to college and i had to step back and be like you know i can't just tell them to do it i have to find the reason why do they not want to do the work why are they thinking that they're so limited and then after that we were able to find a curriculum that worked for them you know not all of them ended up going to high school and graduating some of them had to go to different schools some of them had to do different programs but as long as the goal was to get them to graduate and go to high school that's what worked for them and so that's what we did and so um it's funny um it's funny to see that that um this proverb proverb is true in so many ways but at the same time it helps the person on the other hand to understand that hey you know if you understand this proverb proverb then you would do your best to not to not be that person who's blaming something because they were not able to do something you'll be that person who's always doing their best even if there's a uh, there's 
I don't know, spikes on the floor. Um, they will still find shoes and walk all over those spikes and make it uh, make it onto the other side of the river and excel and do good for themselves. And so, yeah, I think this is a great proverb to know. Um, even if you don't qualify as the kind of person, it helps you check yourself and make sure you're doing the work. Right, right. I love that. I love that. And that's going to lead us to the next question. But first, I just want to recognize a few of our guests who have joined us on Clubhouse. Uh, I can't see who is on YouTube. So if you want to type it on the comment and just say where, you, where you're joining us from and, you know, uh, maybe the flag of your country if you want us to give you a shout out. But on Clubhouse, uh, Jay just joined us and we've been here with Brother Arth and Rushi and MK. Uh, Jay, I hope you're doing well. And I also see Austin and Dan and Laron just listening. I want to say that my guest is really, really amazing. Uh, Angela, prepare to share how people can stay connected with you towards the end of the show. Uh, but now I want you to just share with us a story uh, from your childhood. You know, I love asking my guests this story because when I was eight is when I realized that, you know, I could actually make a difference. And around this time, I had a bicycle uh, that my mother had given me and I was using it to distribute milk and bread in our neighborhood. So I felt I felt like I was a king at that time because most of my friends didn't have bicycles, you know. But then I could not even sit on that the bicycle seat because it was bigger for, than than I than me. So I, I I could go in between the bicycle frame and and I was very popular because everybody saw this little person with you know a, a big load of milk and bread you know, every day before school and over the weekends, almost half the day I was doing that. And uh, until today, I'm just driven. I want to do something. I want to do something. And I, I feel like you're so much like that, uh, given all that you've accomplished since you came to the U.S. I don't know much about uh, what you did before that. That's part of why I want you to respond to this question. So take it away. Um, yeah. So very quickly, I came in the U.S. at the age of 16 with my dad, my mom, and my siblings. We were a total six at the time. Um, I went to high school with no English. I was bullied. I was, I felt alone. I did not get the help that I thought I was going to get. And that really messed me up, um, honestly. I was depressed. I was taking anxiety medicine. I was seeing a therapist every week. I just wanted to go back. I could not understand why is it that I'm coming to the country of my dreams and I'm sleeping on the floor and we're living off of food stamps. I'm going to school under the rain and I can't even speak. I can't even defend myself and tell the teacher that I'm being bullied. All of that was just dying inside. And that really led me to be very depressed. Um, I, I didn't want to go to school anymore um, until, you know, one day I just woke up and I went to school and with my little English I had, I said, if you don't take me out of these classes and challenge me to getting out of these classes sooner, I'm not gonna come back to school because they had me do ESL classes for like six hours a day and that's all I was doing. And I just felt stupid, like learning on this ABCDs. My understanding was way better than my speaking because we do take English classes in Africa sometimes. I just wanted to be challenged, you know, and what I was learning was not helping me. And so eventually um, I advocated to the district. And so they gave me a test to see if I was able to get out of these classes and take, uh, take classes that will actually give me credits because ESL classes in high school don't give you any credits you just end up staying there for years and years and years <clears throat> sorry and so I took the test and I passed and that's when they took me out of those classes and I only kept one ESL class and surprisingly I, I did well I graduated two years later and I went to Highline where I studied political science I graduated with honors and transferred to UW, where I studied accounting. And I graduated and then decided to stay to do my master's of science in accounting. Um, and that was this year that I graduated uh, with my master's degree. Um, so that's my education. But along the way, I did so many other things. Um, I did pageants in 2019. I was the first runner up of Miss Africa. And in 2022, they decided to crown me because there was not a competition. Um, so they just nominated me. So um, 
that's one role I have now, aside from my full-time job and other things I do on the side. Um, so yes, uh, that's. So you're Miss Africa USA or Miss Africa? Miss Africa Washington. Yeah. Well, I want you to speak a little bit about that. How does it feel to be Miss Africa Washington? And, um, you know, if you're talking to other little girls uh, back in, in the Congo, what would you tell them that uh, that role means to you? Oh, my gosh. It means a lot. You know, um, when I started pageantry, I didn't know where that was going to take me. I just wanted to do it for the sake of it because I wasn't really doing much. You know, I was just going to school. But then I started realizing there was a lot to do in life. But I just didn't know how to get there. So when they asked me to compete and represent Congo, I was like, okay, I'll do it. You know, I'm confident enough to do it. But man, that thing broke me and fixed me up and it just straightened me. It was intense. It was really intense, but it really helped me find my voice. It helped me with my words, like how to speak my mind and be eloquent. Because you do go through many other trainings leading up to the competition. And there's a lot of setbacks. There's a lot of competition just within, you know, with the girls, the the drama, like everything just kind of shapes you to the person you will be the day of the show. And so for me, it wasn't even for the crown, you know, it wasn't. Cause even though in 2019 when I didn't win, like I was still out there. Like I was still meeting people with my little teeny bitty crown that I got for being the princess. I didn't care that I didn't have the big crown. Like I was just out there doing my thing. And so eventually that sparked something even in people's hearts to were like, man, you know, even though you didn't win, you're still out there doing the thing because that's not where I was competing. I was competing because I love what I was doing. My platform was to help homeless kids. Why? Because when we came to the United States of America, we didn't have a place to stay. And so when I realized that I said, man, you know, what makes me different compared to the person we're seeing in the streets right now because that could have been me had this lady not opened up her house to let me and my brother stay in her one bedroom apartment <laughs> when we came to the united states of america and so i started helping those people leading up to the competition and even when i didn't win i continued to do the work because i didn't care about the crown and so eventually that paid off you know now i'm the first i'm the queen oh my gosh i'm not even used to saying it <laughs> i'm the queen um but it's really not about the crown it's about the process because maybe if i didn't win i would not be a good queen today maybe if i didn't go through all the setbacks i would not be a good queen today um so what i would say to kids in congo you know watching or the ones that are here it's you know uh, don't put limitations yourself, you know, look beyond how you look like, look beyond the struggles, look beyond your accents, because for a long time, those are the things that held me back. I was holding myself back from doing things in life because I was ashamed of myself. The day I realized I was black in America, I was ashamed of my color. I was ashamed of my accent. I was ashamed of my, the way we dressed in Congo. But when I was able to look over, like beyond that, I just, you know, I said, you know what, I'll be me. I'm just going to be me and um, make sure that people know that I'm not ashamed of being myself. And so maybe that would inspire other kids. And so, yeah, whatever you believe in life that you can do it, you know, just find it in, within yourself to look beyond. Because if you just keep looking at those limitations, you will never see beyond that. You will limit yourself. Yeah, you you are so incredible and uh, really really inspiring. You know, uh, I can't I can't tell you how much how proud I am of you and all that you have accomplished, but also how you really really focus your energy in the community. Uh, but you are also very humble. You know, your humility is is really uh, you know amazing to watch. So. We have been joined here by a few more friends. You know, I see that Stella has also joined us and I can't wait to hear from all of you. At the moment, we are listening to our special guest, uh, Angela. Uh, and Angela is joining us from Seattle, but she's originally from Congo and uh, she's doing incredible work here uh, with the Congolese Integration Network. You know, uh, I'm really... Um, impressed by all that you do i was a judge at a talent show that you all organized uh in 
uh, like two months ago. I want you to speak about that for a moment, but also I just want you to speak about, you know, what does the Congolese Integration Network do and uh, what is your role there? Uh, I, 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 you know, I love what you all do, uh, especially during the pandemic. I'm asking you so many questions at the same time because I know you're an accountant, so you're putting all these things in order. <laughs> But I want you to speak about the the impact that you guys had uh, on the you know on the on the um, you know African community during the pandemic. All the you know you guys got people fed uh, when people are so desperate. You got people uh, clothed and uh, sheltered when things were so desperate. And I commend you all for all that great work. But speak about it. <laughs> Yeah, so um, let's start from the pandemic because that's what led me to where I am today. Um, prior to the pandemic, I was just volunteering as, you know, being Miss, being the first princess of Miss Africa, doing community service. I was mentoring kids through the American school system and getting them to graduate. And so when COVID hit, um, we all stayed home. I didn't have a job at the time. I had quit my job to focus in school because uh, I was about to finish my bachelor's. And so we stayed home and then I just started getting bored. And then I called, you know, CIA and I said, hey, you know, if there's anything you need me to do, let me know. And they said, you know, well, since COVID started, people have been lost. They don't know where to go, where to get food, where to get assistance. And so that's when CIA started looking for people in the community to help other people in the community. And so I joined the team of volunteers and I will literally wake up at 6 a.m. in the morning and go to different food banks in the community and just gathering food in my in my car and leaving it in front of people's doors. Um, we did that for a while until we got um, a deal with the Northwest uh, organization who, used to, who started then dropping off boxes of food at the CIN and we would take these boxes of food and take it to the community so that they can get fed. Uh, during that time, just as volunteers, we served up to 2,000 people with food and also unemployment. Food and unemployment, and eventually that led uh, me to be hired. It was before I was a volunteer, but then after we did that work, that's when I, I started, you know, working there. And um, so the CIN's mission is to usher refugees and immigrants who are entering the American community and society into a, a better uh, integration. So they want people that are coming for the first time to be um, well introduced to the community because I'm one of the victims of people that were not well introduced to the community. We did so many mistakes not knowing the system when it comes to filing taxes, what to do when you get a job and you're on food stamps, you know, and then you ask people for information. Sometimes they don't know the answer, but they still tell you to do something and you do it and it ends up being the wrong thing. Um, and also sometimes there's just no one out there to help you because everybody's busy. And so that's why the CIN is here. We're literally building a village in our organization where people can come and get assistance, whether it's counseling, whether it's just talking to someone. Um, but our main programs are housing. We help people find housing. We help people find jobs and um, trainings like job skills. We help kids with mentoring um, to graduate and also getting some after school uh, tutoring and um, sports activities. We have soccer, basketball, uh, soccer for women and boys. We have a dance class. We have a roaring class. We do camping trips for kids. We just keep them engaged. We don't want them to be out there doing whatever because parents are working. And so now they're falling into the prison pipeline. That was one of our main projects. Um, and also, we also have um, a focus group of women who come and just talk about, you know, struggles of women raising kids in America. And so we're listening from the parents, we're listening from the churches, and we're providing services to the whole family. Um, that's a little bit about the CIN. I know that it's so much broader than that, but that's the main picture. Um, and the event you came to uh, two months ago was the Refugees and Immigrants Week. And the way that was born was simply because we realized that uh, we spent so much time just focusing on the issues. Like we needed something to uplift refugees and immigrants who have been through so much already. What was one thing we could do to make them feel good, acknowledge their progress? And so we created this whole week of activities and just celebration. We celebrate for one week straight, which sometimes end up ends up being eight days instead of seven days, because we even celebrate on Sunday. 
And so uh, we organized, this is the second time we held it this year, um, but we, we basically organized a soccer tournament with different countries competing against each other, just for fun, you know, no hard <laughs> competition there. Uh, but there's a winner who gets a cup and some money, you know, just to uplift them. Um, and then we have a talent show to recognize the, you know, the skills we have in music, fashion, uh, story, uh, po uh, comedy, and doo -doo -doo -doo, and mu dancing. And so we have those four categories for which you were a judge and you did so great. Um, and then at the end of the week, we have a gala where everyone comes in our gowns and we celebrate, we talk, we eat, and we also held an auction. Uh, Cause the whole uh, event celebration this year was actually a fundraising strategy that we used to raise funding for our capital campaign project. Um, yeah, that's incredible. I want you to talk about your capital campaign project because uh, it's it's in motion and you could use the content from this conversation to also promote it. Uh, but also, I want you to take us back a few steps. You know, um, it's not many African uh, communities that are so organized like you guys are here in the diaspora. But also back home, we are you know, we are struggling. We are organized in some ways, but we are struggling in some ways, you know. And uh, uh, women are always really critical in, in, in bringing change to institutions and even countries. If you look at most countries across the world, not just in Africa, that are led by women, you see a lot of change happening. And I feel like your contribution to the Congolese Integration Network is really visible, you know. Uh, and I want you to to just speak to um, you know how how difficult that is uh, for 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 an African woman to 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 you know to work together with a lot of other African men to make a difference, but also um, why it's important that we organize ourselves and and do things like the capital campaign that I want you to speak to as well. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a struggle people don't really talk about, you know, being an African woman living in America, you know. <laughs> not just you it's not just you being black, it's also you being foreign, it's also you being African, it's you being from a third world country. So there's all these stereotypes, you know, that people see first before they see how smart you are, before they see how capable you are of doing things. I have experienced some racism, but at the same time, I feel like that just pushed me to being even, <laughs> even more um, vicious in the way I approach things and being um, and ha just doing things for purpose, you know, and not just doing things because I'm doing it, but actually having a reason as to why I'm doing something. Because you can easily find yourself doing 10 different things and nothing makes sense. How do you focus everything to one goal? That's one thing I struggle with. You know, the moment I started doing pageants, school, business, you know, doing here, 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 I was spreading myself so thin that I had to stay, take a step back and regroup a little bit and see how I can frame everything because I loved everything. I couldn't just let go. I had to frame it and make sure that everything led to one thing. You know, that's why it's important to have a goal. You know, my goal was always to make an impact in my organization. That's why even when I graduated, I told my boss, you know, I, I'm not done here. <laughs> so please find me a way to stay because I don't want to just graduate with the master's and go work for a corporate, you know, company. I'm not against that, but I didn't want to do that now. You know, if I end up doing it, maybe doing it maybe later, I want to keep giving to the community as much as I can. Um, we work in an organization that's led by over 87% women. Um, and there's only three men. Yeah, there's only three men. Um, and so there's a lot of growing up to do <laughs> when you're working with women. There's a lot of uh, just letting go and remembering why you're here. Because if I wasn't able to do that, I would have been picking on, you know, every small flaws and every small little comments, you know, because we're women, we talk a lot, we love to talk, and we see details a lot, like even our, on our bodies, you know, we're the most, we criticize ourselves more than other people do. So um, that's one thing that it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how, what color you are, it's, it's something that has to come from within, you know, you have to know that everywhere you go, 
there will be issues working with amongst other people. That's something you cannot put aside. You cannot escape from that. But how you react is something you can control, not your environment. And so even when I wasn't a fund developer, even when I was just a case manager, you, I was still looking at myself as a leader and I was still going through trainings on how to be a good leader, how to work with other people. And you will learn that you have to be able to let go. And that comes through delegation sometimes, you know, not doing everything yourself, trusting that people can do things, encouraging them. And so when I was put in a position where I had to lead other people, when I was receiving some of the negative comments or the negative, um, uh, I, I don't like to say attitude, but just, you know, behaviors, I was able to look past that and just focus on the main goal. Because when you're going through a stressful moment, especially when you're submitting those grants or putting together an event, you know, as stressful and big as the Refugee and Immigrants Week is, people start getting stressed out. And sometimes they get translated into like, maybe they don't like me or maybe this or maybe that. But that doesn't really phase me anymore because I've been through so much already with women and just, you know, in a working environment that, you know, um, that also helped me just kind of build like a shield to where it's not affecting me so much. Like you can still talk about about me today, but I'm still going to come back to you the next day and say, hello, how are you doing? Because I genuinely want to be able to work with you. I get asked this question a lot. Can you work with this person? I'll be like, yes, of course. Why not? You know, <laughs> and the more you're saying these positive things to yourself, it becomes true because you're working towards that. So you're able to just overlook, overlook. And so, so yeah. Yeah. I want you to speak about how much you're all trying to raise for your capital campaign and what do you want to do with it? Like, let's say you get the money uh, tonight. What are you going to do with it? Paint for us the picture. Tonight? <laughs> I will have a party first. Because <laughs> a capital campaign, oh my gosh, that can go up to five years and yeah, it's you, just begun. <laughs> yeah, you, you should invite me to that party. But hey, anything is possible, you know? Yeah. So let's say it's tonight. What would you yes. do with it? And how much are you trying to raise? Dream big. Um, no, we don't have the big number yet. Because before you even know how much you can fundraise for a capital campaign, you need to, you need to do the hiring of people. You need to hire a cons all the consultants, like the architect, like the, 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 the construction company, the electricians. So before all the hiring is done, you cannot really estimate how much you need for a capital campaign. We don't even have a land yet. <laughs> yeah, but but if you have the vision of this is what we want to create. Mm -hmm. uh, I can talk about that. Yeah, this is what we want to create. And if we were to create it in Seattle, this is approximately how much it would cost us. If we were to mm -hmm. create it, including all the people that you'd hire to help you create it, you know, you could even create a model, you know, of... Mm -hmm like a 3D model of what the the vision is. And then even before you get the land, you can use that to acquire the funding for the land and for all the related costs for whatever project you want to do, you know? Uh, but I'll let you speak. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, okay. So again, we, we went back to the model of listening to the community before we start fixing issues or looking for ways to bring a change and so um the community integration network realized how hard it was for community members to find spaces right we have so many churches now especially in the community uh, of you know people of colors churches are burning almost every other month and and they're struggling with rents and they're having to move place to place um our housing housing is becoming so expensive that people are having to move to the south area to be able to afford their rent. Uh, we're looking to issue. We look into issues like uh, what we're having ourselves with the rental, the facility that we're in. Um, every small, every office we have, it's like a little cubicle. And so, in the beginning, it used to work, but now with the increase. Uh, need of our services, we can, there's not a room in our office that can host one session. Like when we have a session, people have to sit outside, some in a hallway, uh, even a dance class. We started out with 15 kids and now it's, you know, we're reaching 30, 35 a session. 
And so everything is making it possible for us to keep renting these small offices to be able to do our work. And also, as I mentioned, we have uh, a soccer team for boys and girls separate. We have a basketball team, a rowing class. We have a tree training program. We're having all those programs and no nowhere to host them. And when we renting a soccer field, it's like a $75 per hour. Um, and so we looked at all of these issues and realized that we were spending too much on facility rentals. And we looked at the community, they're in need of, of places they can rent affordably. And also they need a place they can feel like they're part of the village that's offering them supports, counseling and assistance. And uh, we looked at our kids, they're in need of some, some place where they can spend time um, with supervising uh, visits where they can uh, engage with each other, have group enrichment um, activities together, which we offer, but in a smaller scale. And so the more the need for our services was increasing and the more the need for the community for spaces was increasing, we decided that to fix all of that, we needed to build a community and healing center. Healing center, why? Because when someone is coming with all this baggage from being refugees for over 20 years, they had all the kids be born in refugee camps, they're not, they don't think like you and I. They need to go through the healing process before they can think beyond their barriers and actually do things for themselves. And that's something that we experience in our organization. You can't just take someone, give them a job and expect them to be great. Oftentimes they will get fired because they're still going through all that anxiety or maybe they're still going through all that um, spirit of just being a victim, that every little thing in their mind is, oh, they're you know, oppressing me or this and that. And so the Capital Campaign Project will offer a space for physical activities, um, sports like basketball, like soccer for women and, and boys, <clears throat> sorry, um, a dance studio, for a dance for the dance class, a space for events that will be rented out to the community affordably and sometimes even um, depending on the purpose, it will be uh, free. Um, it will house our offices and it will also house a transition transitional housing for people that are still going through the healing process so they can get all the counseling they need and feeling confident to enter the American society. And so we're looking at millions. We're looking at tens of thousands of millions. Um, minimum I can see at this point, looking at how huge this project is going to be is at least 10, 10, uh, 10 million. But it's gonna go beyond that because the need keeps growing. We're listening to more people and the need is still growing. So, yeah. Man, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just so uh, inspired by, by everything you just said, by the, the importance of the work, the impact, that it has had so far and also the need for this physical space you know but as you're also speaking i'm looking at the african community uh in 10 years you know uh here in the diaspora not just in seattle because what your um, your ambition is is also what uh the ambition of another angela in the uk is you know my my, my <laughs> i'm not saying that there's actually another Angela doing this, but I'm saying that the, it's possible, you know, it's possible. But I'm saying that especially because the, Af the Northwest African Chamber of Commerce, the, the African Chamber of Commerce of the Pacific Northwest has another similar ambitious vision of building an 80 million uh, project, you know. And so... Uh, I'm seeing some of these things beginning to pop up, you know, in the world, you know, uh, because because uh, without without um, a vision, people perish. If you don't have a vision, uh, this you guys might not accomplish this. Your children will, or your children's children will. Uh, so I'm just saying that what you guys are doing is what our parents did for us, you know. And so it's really important work that you guys know it's long game. And uh, don't be frustrated by the shortcomings. But if you're watching this and you have 10 million, 10 million? 10 million. Yeah, you should talk to Angela. <laughs> so Angela, yeah, just 10 million. People have it as change here in Seattle, actually. You know, this is a city that also has a lot of uh, wealthy people that you might actually find somebody forgot that they have 10 million somewhere. 
<laughs> Anyhow, thank you all for joining us for today's Daily African Proverbs conversation. Our guest has been Angela Ngiangi and um, we talked about this amazing Kenyan proverb. He who is unable to uh, dance blames it on the stony yard. We do have a couple of guests that haven't spoken. So just quickly um, introduce yourself and let us know where you are. And uh, I'll just take a moment to share with us your perspective on this conversation that we've been having. So just quickly, Brother Earth and then Jay and then Stella and then uh, Angela. Think about how you want people to stay connected with you and where you want to send them to support your amazing work. Okay. Brother Earth, go ahead. Peace and love, family. This is Brother Earth from the North Carolina Territory. And, um, you know, honestly, uh, all the family, uh, for all the wisdom, honestly, you, Simon, for the platform. And uh, the sister, uh, she, she said some uh, very powerful things. Uh, and what I'll say to try to t uh, tie it all together is, um, Noble Drew Ali said that the uh, Moorish National and Divine Movement is for strong men and women uh, who think their conditions can be better. And that who uh, men and women who think their conditions can be better is very important. And uh, when I look at the proverb, what I see is uh, a, a lack of uh, self-accountability. You know, a lot of times... Uh, Whenever we fail to do something, can't do something, or don't do something, it's easier to look outside the self and make an excuse as to, you know, why I can't do it or why I haven't done it. it you know, it's easy to make an excuse, but uh, it, it takes uh, self-accountability. It takes uh, strength uh, in order to uh, be able to do what's necessary to, to make uh, the improvements and, um, uh, do what needs to be done. And for, for a long time, I, I was the type of person who made excuses and didn't grow. But uh, now I'm coming to a place where I understand, you know, uh, in order to push forward, I got, uh, I have to be accountable for myself. And I, I have to understand that I'm, I am responsible for making my conditions better. And, uh, and everything starts with the self and, uh, I'll park my plane right there. Peace and love, man. Thank you so much, Brother Hart, for your contribution. Uh, I appreciate it. Hey, Jay, uh, share with us your thoughts as well and where you're joining us from. Uh, hi, Simon. I'm joining you from Seattle. And I was very impressed with Angela. Just like you, Simon, very impressed with uh, where you started including when you first started the, the Daily African Proverb Room and where you are today. And it's like Angela was saying, um, you're starting with that sense of humility. You've got to have humility and you have to have a love and a passion for what you want to accomplish, what you want to do, um, along with a deep drive. You are determined to get there, but you're using that humility as part of those stepping stones. And you have accomplished a lot, uh, both of you have. Um, this is what I wanted to say about the um, prob word. I was, I'm glad I was able to hear Angela speak because it allowed me to see the proverb differently than when I first thought. Um, and that is because both of you are from different countries and you came here and you have achieved a lot. Now, of course, that definitely required um, determination on your part, your focus, your passion, your interest, your love of community, your desire to be a difference and to make a difference. But that stony ground, sometimes that dancing has nothing to do with the fact that you cannot dance. That stony ground is opposition 
that you're running up against a lot of oppositions and challenges and difficulties that hold you back, that hold you down to keep you from doing everything that you want to do in life and everything you're capable of doing and meant to do. And so you may need to move to more fertile ground. It's kind of like the Proverbs in the scriptures that I won't get into. But sometimes you need to move to more fertile grounds. And here you guys are in more fertile grounds with that same level of passion. But now you can dance. Uh, this is Jay and I finished speaking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. I appreciate your contributions as well. Hey, Stella, how are you? Where are you joining us from? And what are your perspectives briefly? Hello Simon, <laughs> this is Stella from Kenya. Uh, hi everyone. Today's proverb reminds me of uh, church yesterday. Uh, the pastor was saying that sometimes the biggest uh, enemies are ourselves because you keep telling yourself that you can't do this when you, you, you have these good plans and then you keep having second thoughts about them and you avoid doing them because you don't believe you can you can achieve it or you don't believe it can happen to you or you don't believe you can do it. So uh, this proverb is basically teaching us that most of the time the war is, is, is within us and when you're able to fight that war and win it, then you can always achieve so many things that you want in your life and uh, <clears throat> I would like to share with Angela about some events that are usually on clubhouse on pitching if she would love to pitch to some of these investors they 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 there's usually an event for how to pitch there's one where you you pitch to the investors there's one where they <clears throat> select pitches from Africans and there's another one where you can practice how to pitch. So uh, if you'd love, she can she can join this event. They, I think they, they are, there's one that is coming up tomorrow. There's another one on October. And then there's another one today. I don't know if it has started. Yeah, but they're always here. They, these events are always here on Clubhouse. Uh, you can just search pitch and then go to the events part and then you, you'll find them or you can search for how to pitch to VCs and angel investors. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. I'll introduce you and Angela by email. Uh, Angela, Stella works with One Vibe in Kenya and uh, is an amazing contributor to this show. You know, she makes this show happen. Uh, and uh, I just appreciate you, Stella, for your incredible words of wisdom. Angela, uh, share with us your closing remarks and also how we can all stay connected with you. Yes, um, actually, thank you so much for all the people that contributed. That It actually helps us to hear other people's thoughts and see their perspective on things. Um, it helps deepen understandings of certain things. Um, and thank you, Stella, for uh, the, the tip. I would definitely look it up and let's stay in touch via email. Um, so um, to reach me, um, it's easier to do it through Facebook. Um, you can just search Angela Ngiangi as it's written on the screen, if you can see it. Um, it's the same on Facebook and Instagram. But to learn more about the work that I do uh, with the organization, the Congolese Integration Network, it's the name you will search for on Facebook. On Facebook and for the website it's going to be cin seattle so congolese integration network seattle that's the website and it's also going to be seen seattle on instagram um definitely go ask questions you know comments on the post and a text or email us whichever way you can on those social media platforms uh, we'll be happy to either answer any questions you have when it comes to the work we do or the capital campaign or just to get in touch you know we love to have the opportunity to share our work because uh, we do a lot and we don't want some narratives to be just lost because um you don't if you don't talk about something it's not going to make an impact 
So um, we are in need of people to just listen, help, give their advice, and also support our work. So I would really appreciate it if you can just go on our social medias and you know share some love. Excellent, excellent. Uh, hey, Angela, thank you again for waking up so early uh, to make this possible. Uh, I know we are supposed to connect later on today, so let's let's uh, you know connect by phone. Uh, you know, to all our viewers on YouTube, thank you, thank you so much. I hope you you are inspired by Angela's story, and uh, I hope you also took away some words of wisdom from today's conversation, especially uh, guided by the proverb. And also to our listeners on Clubhouse, thank you so much. This marks the end of our time together today, Angela. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you so much. You are listening to African Father in America podcast by Simon Javanokelo, live from Seattle, Washington, USA.